with cooking tips, information and 100 recipes to stake your life on. Right, tonight is all about keeping it simple. Keeping it simple in the kitchen doesn't mean you can't have amazing food that not only looks incredible, but tastes fantastic too. My first recipe is so easy, it removes the stress from cooking and is a pleasure to make. Chili beef lettuce wraps. Cooking should never be a chore. The more you cook, the more confident you become. That way, you actually start to enjoy it. And that's the key to good cooking. Have a bit of fun along the way. This is minced beef and minced pork. The pork needs to sit in there, otherwise the beef's gonna dry out. It's really important to season the mince before you cook it. Pan, nice and hot. Touch of olive oil. Mince in. Breaking up like that really helps to sort of separate it so we can fry it off with a lot of colour. With your spoon, just go through. And start breaking that up. The most important thing to remember is mince is made up of cheap cuts, brisket, belly, and short rib. So it needs help. And frying off the mince for colour is so important. If this pan wasn't hot, your mince is going to boil. There's a horrible grey colour on there. And there's no flavour on your mince. Taste a little bit. Mmm. Tastes delicious. It's seasoned beautifully. See how crispy it's going. Take it. Much further than you've ever taken mince before. Nice and crispy. Smells incredible. I'm draining it. It's crucial. It keeps the mince nice and crispy, and you get rid of that excess fat. That's lovely. Now, let's wipe out the pan, then wash it. Low gas. Now we're gonna add texture to the mince. Finely chopped chili, ginger, garlic, and spring onions. Spring onions give the sort of mince a really nice freshness, because it just gives that crunch. Nice and thinly. Now, I'll fry off the chilies, the ginger and the garlic first. Sesame seed oil. Teaspoon only in. Garlic, chilli, ginger in. Fry that off nicely. The sesame seed oil just lifts up the whole flavour. Touch of brown sugar. That starts to really caramelise the chilli, the garlic and the ginger. Mince in. Now, my fish sauce. That gives it the saltiness. You can see now why it was so important to get that mince really crispy because nothing's going soggy, it's staying really crispy. Fresh lime. That makes the mince fragrant. And then lime juice. Roll it. And squeeze that in there. Incredible. I've got the salty. I've got the heat. I've got the sweetness. Now I've got the acidicness as well. And then finally, my spring onions in. Right at the last minute, so I've got crunch in there as well. Smells amazing. Literally cook the mince now with sort of 30 seconds to go. Gas off and take it out. Looks incredible. Smells so inviting. To go with the chilli beef, I'm making a simple sweet and spicy dipping sauce so everyone can dress the crispy mince to their own taste. Dipping sauce, a little teaspoon of the brown sugar, soy sauce. Gives it a nice sort of dark, rich colour. Sesame seed oil, a tablespoon, and just top that up with a tablespoon of olive oil. That stops the sesame seed oil becoming too rich. A teaspoon of fish sauce, and then a touch of chilli. We leave the seeds in again. I want the heat in that sauce. So impressive, an amazing show off. Centerpiece, lime juice in, in the coriander. Chop it through once. Give that a little mix up. Just check the seasoning. Mm, that's lovely, nice and rich. Now the lettuce. I'm going to use baby gem because it's really nice and durable and sort of quite strong. So you just sort of sit these nice trimmed lettuce leaves around. Now the exciting part to serve. Take your lettuce up, spoon in your mince, and then a little touch of dressing, just a little drizzle. Nice. 
And that's the secret of having good, easy, relaxed food, is that you just help yourself. Food that looks and tastes a million bucks doesn't have to be complex. This dish is as fun to cook as it is to eat. One of the keys to keeping it simple is to prepare all the ingredients in advance. The more organised you are in the kitchen, the easier cooking becomes. Here are three of my favourite quick recipes that, with a bit of advanced preparation, are so simple to make. Starting with my easy, fragrant fried rice. First, get prepped. Chop garlic, ginger and chilli, keeping the seeds for extra kick. Slice spring onions, chop spring greens and trim a head of broccoli. Then whisk two eggs. Prep done, stir fry on. Add a good lug of oil to a hot pan. Garlic, ginger, chilli. Next, the spring greens and broccoli. Add water to steam. Then cook rice. This dish is perfect for using leftover rice. Make a well. Add the eggs, spring onions, and a dash of fish sauce. Scramble, then mix. Season. Top with lime and spring onions. My fragrant fried rice. Made simple with advanced prep and ready in five minutes. My next recipe it pays to get prepped for is garlic and saffron mayonnaise. First, get your ingredients to hand. Eggs should be out of the fridge and at room temperature. Soak saffron in warm water. Saffron is the most expensive spice in the world, made from the dried stigma of crocus flowers. But even a pinch gives a fantastic taste and a wonderful colour. Next, separate three eggs. Put the yolks into a mixing bowl. Add Dijon mustard, finely chopped garlic, the drained saffron, and a squeeze of lemon, then mix. Whisking constantly, add oil slowly. It won't take forever. For perfect flavour, use half olive oil and half vegetable oil. When the mayonnaise comes together, season. A smooth, thick consistency means it's done. Top with saffron. Rich, delicious and perfect with everything from seafood to sandwiches and chips. My second recipe, garlic and saffron mayonnaise. Easy to get right as long as you've planned ahead. My final dish, that's a cinch to cook with a little advanced prep work, is mussels with celery and chilli. First, prep the veg, chop spring onions, shallots, a clove of garlic and chilli to taste. Then thinly slice celery, add a bay leaf and thyme, veg ready. Add oil to a pan and fry. Season, then add mussels and stir. Mussels are one of my favourite shellfish, cheap, healthy and delicious. Cover and steam for a couple of minutes. As the mussels open, add vermouth and aromatic fortified wine. And 150 ml of dry white wine. On a high heat, reduce the liquid to create a sauce. Discard any mussels that are still shut. Then finish with creme fraiche and chopped parsley. Minimal prep and cooked in less than 10 minutes. My mussels with celery and chilli. Impressive, affordable and super speedy. Make it simple in the kitchen by prepping your ingredients in advance. And I promise you'll find these three recipes a pleasure to make. You don't need to spend a fortune on masses of kitchen equipment. 
This is my quick guide to kitchen knives. You basically need three knives. A heavy duty chopping knife, followed by a small paring knife, which is brilliant for prepping vegetables, and then this baby here, a serrated edge knife for carving and slicing. Basically, that is it. Before you buy a knife, hold it in your hand and make sure it feels right for you. The secret behind a great set of knives is in the handle. If you're comfortable holding the handle, your cutting is going to be so much easier. The firmer the grip, the better the chopping. The heavier the handle, the more control you've got over the blade. With these three knives, you can't go wrong. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. This is my guide to keeping it simple. My next recipe is easy and a pleasure to make if you're organised with everything ready in advance. Miso poached salmon with Asian vegetables. Organisation is key in the kitchen. Take a couple of minutes before you start and set yourself up. Make sure you know where everything is, stock, spatula, pan, etc. It becomes less stressful, but more importantly, the end results are incredible. First off, get your pan on. Whisk and stock. Start off with this amazing fermented soybean puree. Into the pan. Three nice tablespoons. Gas on. Now get your fish stock and whisk into the puree. Be generous with the stock. You want this nice, light broth, basically. You can buy miso paste from big supermarkets and it works brilliantly with salmon. Poaching the salmon in the miso stock gives it a really nice sort of sweet, earthy, creamy flavour. It's incredible. Bring it up to the boil. I'm going to infuse the broth and make it a little bit more fragrant. Kaffir lime leaf is very lemony inside the miso broth. Then chop chilli. Chilli's in. And finely sliced ginger. That's simmering beautifully. Now, we're going to poach the salmon. Poaching means cooking it in liquid, but it's cooked gently. And the secret here is to keep that salmon skin on. If we took the skin off now, the salmon can actually break up whilst it's poaching. Skin side, down. Just going to slide that in. Under. Nice. The minute that stop starts boiling, turn it down and let it simmer. Take a little ladle and just every couple of minutes pour over. That makes sure the top of the salmon is cooked evenly and keeps it nice and moist. And poaching is one of the most delicate ways of cooking, so you have to handle it with care. Whilst the salmon's poaching in the miso broth, start preparing your vegetables. I'm using tender stem broccoli and bok choy. I always like to cook the leaf and the stem separately. The leaf is like sort of spinach, and the stem is so much thicker, it's almost as thick as a stick of celery. So I like to get the stems sliced, just so I've got that nice sort of crispness. Place the leaves together nicely, roll them up nice and tight, and then slice them down. Now, my salmon, already the flavour in that broth has been elevated. Mm. Now it tastes really fishy, you've got the heat, the, the chilli, spiciness of the ginger and the kaffir lime leaf. Take your fish slice and place it very gently underneath the salmon and push it down. Fish slices are flexible for that reason. Bend it. Lift it up, just touch, you're looking for a springy, firm texture. And just sit that on top. A little touch of the broth over it. It stops it from drying out. Leave that to cool down for two minutes. Bring the stock back up to the boil. Broccoli in, bak choy. Stems in, a little taste. Mm. It's getting better and better and better. Cook the broccoli and the bok choy stems for one minute and then add the tops in. Turn the salmon into your hand and just peel all that skin off. And the skin also helps to keep the salmon nice and moist. Then gently flake the salmon. That's the secret behind poaching. Everything just stays so moist. Wonderful long shards of pink. Now, just before we serve, we're going to add our mushrooms. These are enoki mushrooms. You can buy these enoki mushrooms in big supermarkets and good grocers. Slice them off. I'm going to put half in. 
And the other half, I'm going to serve with the salmon. Toasted sesame seed oil. Put a little drip in there. Just rub. And you're just lining, almost like a little coat of varnish. Start off with your mushrooms and then my salmon. Four nice layers. And then finally, the mushrooms. Top with the vegetables. And then finally, a nice ladle. That beautiful, really sumptuous, rich stock. Lovely. And that is an amazing miso poached salmon soup. Simplify your cooking by getting organised, and amazing food will be coming out of your kitchen every day. And for great food, you need great ingredients. Next up, my shopping guide to getting the finest fish. When I buy my fish, I only want the freshest and the best. And if anyone knows how to get the best, it's Roger Kent Barton. He's been buying and selling fish at the world-famous Billingsgate Market in London for over 50 years. I love fish. I think it's the greatest food of all time. I sell literally every variety there is. I could feed you a different fish 365 days a year. This guy really knows how to sniff out the good from the bad. All fish smell different. The longer it's around, the more fishy it will smell. When it's lovely and fresh, it doesn't smell. Whenever you're going to buy fish, don't be frightened. Get your nose right into it. Don't go like that. Get it into it. Smell it. <sighs> smells delightful. It smells what I call salmony, and it's lovely. Barramundi, it's a lovely fish. The way to tell good fish is, look at it closely. It's shining. It's still got the bloom on it. His eyes are as bright as yours. Look in the gill, lovely and red. Put it in a bag for the gentleman, please. People should always be asking about their fish. What kind of fish is it? Where does it come from? A nice salmon. 19 pound. It's a bargain at 20 pound. Roger's right. Salmon's brilliant value and a great all-rounder. Really healthy and super delicious. Here's a quick look at the different cuts and how to use them. Whole salmon always impresses. It's fantastic stuffed and steamed, either in a fish kettle or in the oven wrapped in foil. Steaks are great value and brilliant baked. A side of salmon is perfect for poaching, home curing, or baking in pastry. The fillet is so versatile, easy, fast to cook, and great for pan frying. Smoked salmon, delicious cooked or raw. I love it with scrambled eggs. Broadly, there's white fish and there's oily fish. They come under two different sections. Here we have white fish. It's lovely. It's cod. It's the best cod in the world. It comes from a place called Peterhead. It's nice and white. The whiter, the better. One of the most oily fish you'll find. Mackerel. There it is. Lovely colour with most fish. The fresher they are, the harder they are. If you're not well and you're ill, have a mackerel. Sprats, otherwise known as top hats. Here we have flatfish, and these are known as place. As you can see, they've got spots. The redder they are, the fresher they are. It really is a lovely fish to eat. King George couldn't have better. For fish fresh enough for royalty, follow your fishmonger's advice, and you'll never, ever have another dodgy Dover sole again. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. First, how to chop an onion. This is the root. That's absolutely crucial. Leave that on there. If you cut that off, the onion will start to bleed and you'll start crying rapidly. Slice going forward. Let the weight of the knife do the work. Three fingers, one in front, two behind. And this part of the knuckle is going to guide the knife. Fingers on top of the onion, point the knife towards the root and try to get as close to the root as possible. Nice, long stroke. And then push the onion back together. Push the knife halfway in to the onion. Slightly tilt the knife down. One at the top. And then gripping the onion like a tennis ball, holding it together in place. With the weight of the blade to cut through that onion to get to the base of the root. Again, turn it round. Up and down motion. And that's what we're left there. No waste, just the root. And look, there, you've got a really nice, finely chopped onion. So much great cooking depends on starting with a high enough heat. 
If a recipe calls for a hot pan, put it on early so it gets smoking hot. And always remember to preheat your oven at least 20 minutes before cooking. A clean cook is an efficient cook. My tip for a tidy cooking area is to always have a waste bowl next to you. It saves you going back and forth to the bin. Never add salt to eggs before cooking them because it ruins the texture and dulls the color. Instead, save your seasoning to the very end. The key to cooking meat is to make sure it's at room temperature before you begin. Cooked straight from the fridge, the muscle fibers will be tight, which results in tough meat, and always let it rest afterwards. So it relaxes, becoming tender and juicy. Follow my ultimate cookery course crammed with key lessons. Top tips and a hundred recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking. The frying pan is one of your best friends. It's so versatile in the kitchen. Learning to use it with ease is a must, and I'm going to show you how. First up, my delicious pan-fried pork chops with sweet and sour peppers. Whether it's in the restaurant or even at home, one of my golden rules for producing fantastic food is learning to cook with confidence. This recipe is so straightforward, but tastes absolutely amazing. Pan on. Get that nice and hot. You think of the sort of density of a pork chop, how it needs a little bit of help. Sweet and sour peppers go brilliantly well. First, slice the peppers. That's the flat side of the pepper, so stand it up. Trying to slice a pepper on the side is a nightmare. There's the center. Start off. It's almost like sort of peeling an orange. Go all the way around and down. And look, that's what you want. Now, place the pepper down. Three finger rule. One finger in front, two behind. Pinky holding it down, thumb holding it nice and flat. The flatter the vegetables, the more confident you are when you slice. So, don't worry about the speed. Just let the knife do the work and take your time. Speed comes. The most important thing is to get your technique right. Red onion. Now, swing sour peppers. Olive oil in. I'm going to saute them, which is just the chef's term for shallow frying on a high heat for maximum taste. Some salt and pepper. Add a tablespoon of sugar. Sugar helps to break down the peppers quicker, but caramelizes the onions. Frying them in a frying pan, perfect. It's one of the sort of basic essential tools of any kitchen because it's so multi-purpose. Great for sauteing, tossing, great for cooking fish and meat. Push away and pull back. Push away and pull back. That hissing is something you need to hear constantly because the minute that's gone, your peppers and your onions start to boil and you really want them to soak it. You now start to see it glistening in a way that it's starting to caramelize. Sugar's working beautifully. That's ready for the red wine vinegar. In. It smells incredible. It helps to stain the peppers as well. Look at the glaze now. You can see the sugar. It's worked, it's magic. Turn down the gas and add a couple of tablespoons of fresh extra virgin olive oil. Let them stew for two to three minutes. Now, I want to make the peppers nice and light and sort of sweet, aromatic. Just roll the basil, almost like a big cigar. Slice. Basil in, and then literally cook it out for 30 seconds. I want them off. Beautiful. OK, pan back on. And now for the pork chops. I want to make sure they don't curl up in the pan. If they start curling up in the pan, they're going to cook unevenly. A few simple cuts through the rind means the chop stays flat and cooks evenly. Point the knife down. Flip through. Just season them beautifully. Nice large shards of pepper. Punch that through lightly. Guarantee that seasoning is going to stay there. Hot pan, a touch of garlic and a touch of thyme. And the garlic, take a couple of cloves. Don't peel it, don't chop it, just knife on. 
crushing. Olive oil in, just starting to smoke. Top of the chop, in. And lay away from me. Nice. Keep that heat in the pan. Put the garlic in there early. A nice fragrant bunch of thyme. See how the pork has stayed nice and flat. Turn that over. Look at that. Beautiful. I want a little bit of thyme underneath there. Start squeezing that garlic out. I want the flavour coming out. Butter in. Thin slices of butter. Tilt the pan and baste. So I'm sort of speeding up the cooking process. At the same time, I'm keeping the pork chop really nice and moist. And now look at the colour of that butter. It's almost like sort of a nut brown. Check the colour on the other side. Beautiful. When they're that thick, three and a half to four minutes each side. 30 seconds from now, they're going to be medium, so I'm going to take them out and let them rest. The secret to perfectly moist pork chops is letting them rest almost as long as they're cooked in the pan. A nice spoon of these peppers. The basil smells incredible. Keep that garlic on there. Be generous with that vinaigrette for the peppers because it really is incredible. Do two things simple like that, pork and peppers, and your confidence is going to shoot through the roof. A stunning pork chop with sweet and sour peppers. The frying pan is so simple, but incredibly useful. With this one pan, you can make a million different dishes. The more you cook with your frying pan, the more your confidence will grow. Here are three of my favourite easy pan-fried dishes. First up, pan-fried scallops with crunchy apple salad. Get a frying pan smoking hot. Essential for quick pan frying. Add olive oil. Then season scallops with salt and pepper. Starting at the top, put clockwise into the pan so you know which one to turn first. Scallops have firm, white, sweet flesh and cook in minutes. Next, salad, lamb's lettuce. Matchsticks of apple. Seasoning. Lemon, zest and juice. Add olive oil, then toss. Turn the scallops when golden, going clockwise around the pan. Then squeeze in lemon juice and give the pan a shake. Finish with lemon zest. Ready in under 10 minutes. My first pan-fried dish, scallops with crunchy apple salad. My next super simple pan-fried recipe is chicken and chicory in masala sauce. Season the chicken breasts. Add to hot olive oil, skin side down, Lay away from you to stop the oil splashing. Sliced chicory. This versatile vegetable can be red or white. Has a lovely bitter taste and is great cooked or raw. Crush a clove of garlic and add. Then sprigs of thyme. When the chicken skin is crisp, turn over. Along with the chicory. For the sauce, add masala, a sweet fortified wine from Sicily. Then 150 ml of chicken stock. To make the sauce wonderfully rich and glossy, add butter and simmer for 10 minutes. Plate up and spoon over the sauce. Cooked in under 20 minutes, chicken and chicory in masala sauce. My final dish cooked in the versatile frying pan is sea bream with tomato and herb salsa. Fry fillets of sea bream skin side down in hot olive oil. If they buckle up, press gently down for perfect even cooking, then season. Sea bream has firm white flesh, perfect for pan frying. Next, the salsa. 
heat olive oil, add halved cherry tomatoes, pitted black olives, and season. After a minute, on a low heat, add coriander, basil, and lemon. Combine and leave to infuse. As the sea bream cooks, it goes opaque. When it's two-thirds from the top, turn over. Baste, fry, and it's done. Sea bream with tomato and herb salsa, ready in under 15 minutes. One pan, three simple, impressive, and absolutely delicious dishes. Beautiful. Coming up on my ultimate cookery course, along with 100 recipes to stake your life on, I'm going to give you 100 quick cooking tips to make your life in the kitchen easier. First up, how to keep your knife sharp. It's far harder working in the kitchen with a blunt knife than it is with a sharp knife. The secret behind keeping a sharp knife, sharpen it before and every time you use it. First, grip the steel. Feel really comfortable about holding the steel. Imagine you're holding a tennis racket or you're playing squash. You've got to be really comfortable with it. Now, 45 degrees, confident grip, confident grip with the knife. This is the butt of the steel. Really important you keep your fingers behind that. You never grip a steel with your fingers over that because the knife comes back in, you've just lost a finger. Always grip behind. Nice long strokes so we get the whole of the blade over the steel. Stroke. And we start from the bottom to the top. So there, across. There, across. Slow strokes over the top of the steel. And then come back in the knee. Then back in the knee. It is so dangerous working in the kitchen with a blunt knife. You can cause so much damage. Working with a sharp knife is 10 times quicker, more efficient. Now, that's ready to start chopping. Stop your chopping board rocking or slipping, a great tip is to simply wet a kitchen cloth, kitchen paper or tea towel and place it underneath. Now you can chop with confidence. My next top tip is get the most out of your humble veg peeler. It's brilliant for slicing ultra-thin ribbons of veg, perfect for Asian dishes. Great for making long delicate parmesan shavings to top soups and salads. It also makes wonderful chocolate curls. Your pepper mill is more versatile than you might think. Tighten the top screw to get finely ground pepper, ideal for soups and sauces. For general seasoning, you want it medium ground, so set the screw in the middle. And loosen it right off for coarse pepper, perfect for steaks and fish. Peeling garlic. For one clove, simply bash it with the back of a knife and the skin comes off easily. For a whole head, Crush, separate into a bowl. Cover and shake hard for about 10 seconds. Then simply pick out the peeled cloves. This is my ultimate cookery course. 100 recipes to stake your life on. I'll be showing you a roast chicken recipe to die for. Hold the drum and slice straight through. But first, like any good chef, I'm always looking to get great ingredients at the right price. My shopping mantra is simple. First, rely on your senses. Make sure whatever you're buying, it looks, smells, and really feels good. And if you get the chance, taste it before you buy it. Second, is to recognize that knowledge is crucial. The more you know about where your ingredients come from and how they're produced, the better. So, ask lots of questions and learn. You're never too old to learn from experts. And when it comes to buying great birds, one person knows what to look for is award-winning fifth-generation master butcher, Danny Lidgate. Poultry is a great meat because there's many different types of birds it's worth tasting. The variation in flavors between different birds to birds is massive. Turkey is a great lean meat that's available all year round, not just for Christmas. Anybody who's worried about eating fatty meats, it's a really healthy, flavorsome meal. Okay, yeah. Game birds. People don't try them often enough. Once they're shot, they're hung up for a little while, a few days at least. It means the meat's going to be more tender. It all adds its flavour to the bird. You've got a wood pigeon and a red leg partridge. Both really good and cook really quickly. 
when you're buying a chicken, some of the things to look out for is obviously the smell. And when you're smelling a good quality chicken, you can tell the difference. The skin's a nice white colour and it smells like a fresh chickeny smell. When you're buying from a good butcher, you'll find you tend to get the giblets as well, which is basically the neck and other organs. This is great for making gravy. Once you have cooked it, you can use all the offcuts for other things, stir fries, curries, pasta dishes, save the bones, use the bones for stocks and soups. They're really packed full of flavour. And remember, there are lots of different breeds of chicken, all have different characteristics and flavours. So shop around and find the ones you love. Here are three of my all-time favourites. The label Anglais. These come from an old British breed. They've got smaller breasts, but the meat's delicious. The Black Leg, a fantastic French variety, succulent with bags of flavour and really meaty thighs. And the Poulet de Bresse. This is the Rolls Royce of chickens, rich, gamey and delicious, one for special occasions. I think people should maybe try and buy less meat, but aim for the best quality. You're only going to get out what you put in. By putting the best quality into a dish, you're going to get the best results. No matter how seasoned a chef you are, there are always new ingredients and recipes to get fired up about. So, if a tired old recipe is getting you down, spice it up with fresh ideas and flavours. My next recipe is an old classic roast chicken, but with a simple twist, it takes on a new life and is guaranteed to impress. One of the things I love about cooking, and that keeps me excited after 25 years behind the stove, is that there's always something new to learn every day. New ingredients, new techniques, and new cuisines. Start off with the stuffing. It's amazing how exciting a stuffed roast chicken can be because it keeps the chicken incredibly moist and gives a delicious texture inside the bird. I'm going to start off with cured cerezo. This is a traditional Spanish sausage and it's garlicky, spicy, incredibly meaty. That gives a little bit of sort of richness to the stuffing. Get that cerezo in. Start cooking that down and getting all those oils out. A little touch of olive oil in there to get it going. Right, onions. Chopped. Add the onions to the cerezo, and in a matter of seconds, they'll change colour as they soak up all the flavour. That lovely spiciness has been stolen from that sausage, and now the onions smell incredible. Garlic. Garlic in. Fresh thyme. Just hold it down and put your fingers on there. And it's a really nice way of taking off all those nice, fragrant little thyme flowers. You can hear it crackling in the background. These are cannellini beans. They're waxy, very soft, and so delicious, but very dense. But for stuffing, they're so robust, nothing breaks down. Drain them off. In. They're going to take on all that juice as well from the cerezo. I'm going to season them now because they're very dense, so it needs some help. I mean, that looks like it's a dish on its own. Good enough to eat now. I want to sweeten things up a little bit. Tomatoes, half dried. In. That sweetens up the stuffing. Beautiful. The stuffing's ready. Look at the colour of everything. It looks Spanish, it looks delicious. Now, stuffing the chicken. I like taking off these little knuckles. As the chicken cooks, the skin stretches over the bone. You can get a really nice drum. And take off those little wing tips as well. Salt, pepper. So important. Now, with your stuffing, I want to go right inside the chicken. Push it down. This really helps to cook the bird evenly because you're pushing out all the empty spaces in the carcass. And take a nice, large lemon. Push the lemon in. Pick up the parson's nose, pull the skin over. Olive oil on top, salt and pepper. A teaspoon of paprika. Sprinkle it on and then get your hands and sort of rub that in. You can see what the paprika's doing to the chicken. It's putting this like sweet, spicy marinade. It's not even roasted yet, but it looks delicious. 
400 ml of white wine. Same quantity of water. That helps the chicken to steam. Chicken in. Be generous with the thyme sprigs. Make sure the foil is folded tightly around the roasting tray so the chicken steams in the oven, keeping it moist and juicy. Into the oven. Cook for one hour at 180 degrees with the foil on. Nice. Take it out and remove the foil lid. Then give it another 30 minutes to crisp up that skin. Look at that. It's so important to make sure you take that tin foil off with half an hour to go. Beautiful. Pierce that open, squeeze it in that delicious gravy. Mix that into the tray. And sip that. That's a really nice, fragrant, lemony, spiced roasting juices to finish. Before we cut up the chicken, take out that amazing stuffing. Mmm. Incredible. I'd have that with chicken over potatoes any day. And then just get your chicken roasting juices. Now, to cut the chicken up, hold the drum and slice straight through. And there's that wonderful drum and the thigh. Through the wishbone, off. Slice with the point at an angle so you can see the texture of that amazing roast chicken. Just take my cooking juices. Just want to give a really nice sort of lemony flavour over my chicken. And there you go. A delicious, very charming, stuffed roast chicken. Follow my ultimate cookery course crammed with key lessons. Top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking.